Hello, good morning. I, can you all hear me okay? Okay, great. It is such an honor to be here. Thank you all so much for having me, for inviting me, and for your warm welcome. It's been delightful to be in your wonderful city for the first time. I confess this is my first time to Amsterdam, and I've just found it delightful. And how great to share this day with you. I, I love the idea of this conference, your uplifting new facility, just the brightness you can tell ideas will be fostered in such an environment, and to share this day with your great faculty and students and members of the public. So my purpose today is to share with you um, a little bit of who I am, what I did and what I learned, um, and then to talk about how my study of one corner of the world has relevance to the broader world environment. And so I will um, start off by talking about a very specific place in the world, but then broaden my remarks to talk about Europe in particular. So thank you again for having me. Um, my, my topic is not very uplifting, I confess, but I would just say um, throughout the day, probably, throughout my remarks, but throughout the day to keep in mind what a great thing it is that all of you are giving up your Saturday to gather together to talk about these issues and learn about them. I think it, that gives me a lot of hope. So without further ado, um, I want to make sure I know how to forward this right. OK, so a little bit about me. I am a public opinion scholar, which when I say that phrase, automatically you think of public opinion survey polls, right? Scientific sampling polls, either conducted in person or by telephone. Those things are very important to me. They are our best way of capturing what a cross-section, a broad cross-section of people think. But the thing that fascinates me most is why people think what they do, how they interpret the political world, how they interpret the world around them, and how that matters for how they think about politics. And you might guess from the titles of my books, which all seem to have the word talking in them, I have found that one of the best ways to study how people interpret the world is to listen to them talk with one another about life, about politics too, but talk with one another with the people that they know in the places that they normally gather. I come from a discipline or a, a section of a discipline that is typically asking this question. Why is it that people vote against their interests? How can people be so stupid, right? Yeah, that's a less charitable way of putting it, right? <laughs> yes. And my interest in why people think what they do kind of comes out my discomfort with this question because I Maybe naively, still, I've studied this for my whole career, but I still believe in democracy. And I still believe that the ordinary person can, hopefully, with the right information, perhaps, make a, a rational, a good decision. And so in my work, rather than ask this question, why do people vote against their interests, I am trying to ask, and not, I should say, not what are people getting wrong, but instead, how are people understanding their world? So that's a little bit about where I'm coming from. More specifically, geographically, here's where I'm coming from, North America, right? My university is in the state of Wisconsin, which is a Midwestern state in the Great Lakes region of uh, the United States, which I've circled here. And when I was sprinting for tenure, back about 10 years ago, which will become important in a moment, I was very interested in how social class identity matters for the way people interpret politics. And I also wanted to study what I study in this place that I love, this corner of the world that I love, the state of Wisconsin. So my question was, how does social class matter for the way people interpret politics? And I used Wisconsin as my window because honestly, I wanted a good excuse to drive around my state, spend time with the people who live there, and discover great places to eat pie. So what I wanted to do was to find conversations and invite myself into them in communities that um, ranged broadly in terms of social class. So 
places where low income places, high income places, people where they were farmers, people where they were kind of urban professionals. My strategy was I was going to sample communities across my state and then in each of those communities ask around for a group of people that I could invite myself into. And my thinking was that if I sampled some farming communities, small towns, urban centers, that that strategy would lead me to a broad range of people with respect to social class. And I'm thinking of social class very broadly here, both in terms of occupation and income. Um, and so these are the communities that I sampled, 27 across the state. Um, I will show you in a moment which ones are more urban and which ones are more rural, but um, mainly the urban ones are in the southern part of the state for now. There are 27 communities in all. I started back in 2007. My intention was to visit, find a group in each of these places and then invite myself into this group periodically for a couple of years. So I ended up doing this longer than a couple of years, as you might guess, because the book didn't come out until 2016. <laughs> but uh, you'll see why in a moment. When I had sampled a place, I called up a local newspaper editor or someone who works in our broad university extension system. So I work for a public university, and that university has an, a branch to it, or the university system has a branch to it, in which there's uh, an office in all each of the 72 counties across the state. So the state is carved up into 72 different sub-regions. And there's a university office in each of those, and those folks do a lot of public outreach, a lot of collaboration with local people, and so they know those communities really well. I called up the office and I said, where in such and such Wisconsin can I go to find people who talk with one another regularly in a place that I could get access to? And I will show you some of the pictures of the places that they sent me. They were diners, cafes. In a lot of the smaller communities, they sent me to gas stations or service stations. Because in the smallest town, there's no cafe. There's no McDonald's even, believe it or not. <laughs> um, and there's no restaurant. Sometimes I was meeting up with people in the basement of a church because there wasn't even a service station. You had to drive quite a way to, quite a way to get gas or petrol. And in the church, even if you weren't a member of the congregation, people sort of knew that once a week, for example, there were folks meeting in the basement and everyone was welcome and they turned on the coffee machines and there you go. So what I did was to, for example, say a, a small community, someone said, okay, at dawn, every day, there's a group of folks meeting on their way to work or a bunch of retirees. I would drive out, stay in the closest hotel, get up early in the morning, drive over to the gas station, take a deep breath, walk in and say, hi, I'm Kathy from the University of Wisconsin, Madison. Do you mind if I join you this morning? Thank you for laughing, because yes, they would laugh. And they'd say, sure, we've got nothing better to do. <laughs> and I would uh, sort of sit down if it was possible, give them a business card so they knew who I was and how to contact me. I gave them a token of my appreciation, such as a pen or a pad of Post-it notes or a football schedule, American football schedule. Um, and someone would say, are my taxpayer dollars paying for this? <laughs> and I'd say, no, 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 they're donated by the Alumni Association. And then I would say, do you mind if I turn on my recorder? I had a recorder that was maybe twice this size when I started out. Things have become much more efficient. I use my iPhone now, but I still put this recorder in the middle of the table. So it's very clear that something unusual is going on. And then I would say, so tell me, what are your big concerns around here? What are you all talking about? And they would tell me. And I had some focused questions to follow up, a few specific issues that I knew that I wanted to elicit their thoughts on, issues that I knew would generate talk that was somehow bring in social class identity. Because remember, I'm focused on social class identity at this point. But about a year in, so there, I should back up to say there were 39 groups in all over these 27 communities. And so my first year, I was back around to about half of them three times, some less than that. About a year in, it was undeniable that what I was hearing in the smaller communities was shocking to me and important. 
and it is what I refer to when I talk about the politics of resentment. So I'm going to, to describe that resentment for you and then talk about how it uh, became quite obviously important for our politics as time went on. So the resentment sounded like this. When I said to folks, tell me, what are the big concerns in this community? They would describe what was going on in their town or their city or their suburb in a way that referred to a map of Wisconsin that basically looked, sounded like Madison and Milwaukee versus the rest of us, or so-called outstate Wisconsin. And this is what they were saying. So Madison is the state capital with the star here down in the bottom tier of the state. And that is uh, where my university is located. And that is one of the main metropolitan centers in the state. Milwaukee is the other. Milwaukee is the industrial city in the state. Those are the two main metropolitan areas. And Chicago is kind of here. And so this southern corner, it's kind of mainly southeast, but southern central corner, is the ur very urban part of the state. The rest of the state is quite rural. In all of the other communities on here, it's a little bit deceiving in that the type and the dots are all the same size because those communities are much smaller than Madison and Milwaukee. And so people would say to me, look, there's basically Madison and Milwaukee, and sometimes they'd say the M&Ms, Madison, Milwaukee, and then there's the rest of us. That was one clue that something was going on. But there was so much more to the way people talked about this urban versus rural divide. They were telling me also that all of the decisions are made in Madison and Milwaukee, and they're communicated out to us, and there's no listening going on in reverse. People don't come out here, except you, Kathy. You seem a little odd. People don't, people don't come out here and ask us what we're thinking about. Instead, they tell us, they regulate us, they communicate to us, not with us. They were also telling me that Madison, the state capital, pulls in all of our taxpayer dollars, spends them on itself or on Milwaukee, and we never see that money in return. So they're telling me we're not getting our fair share. We're not getting our fair share of attention or power, and we're not getting our fair share of stuff, of money. And finally, they were telling me, and I think that this is most important in light of the presidential election, this past presidential election, they were telling me we don't get our fair share of respect because those people making decisions, they don't know us. They have never lived in a place like this. They don't understand us, and they don't actually even like us. They think we're uneducated. They think we're stupid. They think we're sexist and racist and homophobic and Islamophobic, and those are terms I'm putting on the sentiments that they were conveying to me. But they were saying, we don't get our fair share of respect. We work hard. We deserve more. So all of that together is what I mean by rural consciousness in the subtitle of my book, which is just a social science term for a combination of a, an identity with a social group that's infused with this sense of injustice, of distributive injustice, or injustice with respect to power and attention and respect, all of those things together. And that's what I mean by resentment. It's this, sometimes it's anger, right? But it's this slow boiling sense of long, over a long period of time, not getting what we deserve not getting what we deserve. And it's resentment towards cities and city people. But there's so many different layers to it, which is partly why I think it's so powerful. Because a politician can tap into one corner of it and ignite the rest of it. So resentment towards city and city people, but it's also resentment toward elites, government elites, corporate elites sometimes, higher education elites, people in the health industry, so forth and so on. But it's also resentment toward Democrats, which people increasingly, Democratic Party, our left-leaning party, right, um, increasingly seen as an urban party, that the Democrats are affiliated with the cities. And it's also resentment toward racial and ethnic minorities. 
especially in Wisconsin, in my part of the country, and in Wisconsin in particular, it's heavily, heavily racially segregated, so that in these rural areas, there are very few racial or ethnic minorities. In the southern tier, there are some Latino immigrants. They are, um, there's quite a few employed in the dairy industry. We have great cheese in Wisconsin. Not as great as here, don't tell anyone, but it's a, you know, a very much a dairy state. Um, and there is also a substantial Native American population in Wisconsin, primarily in the northern third of the state. But for the most part, um, most of racial and ethnic minorities, especially the African American population, is concentrated in Milwaukee and Madison. And so all of these things together are going on when people are exhibiting their resentment toward the cities. And here's how it mattered um, for politics. So, what I want to do here is sort of lay out how this sentiment, kind of just characterize the sentiment a little bit more so that you can see how politicians have tapped into it. Because what I want to argue to you is that, remember that I am hearing this sentiment in 2007, or even before the Great Recession at this point, or long before Donald Trump, right? And so this sentiment is here, is there. And long before I'm driving around the state having coffee in gas stations, right? It's been growing, it's been building. But while I'm in the field, our local politicians, meaning I should say local to the state, Scott Walker in the subtitle is a governor, uh, the executive of the state um, who's elected during this time. And then Donald Trump, they've figured out how to tap into it. So here's what I mean. Here's setting the stage. So if you're looking at the world through this perspective, you're, the sentiment is very ripe for divisive messages because what you're saying is, I am working so hard. I'm working so hard to make ends meet and I'm not getting what I deserve. It's really um, often, especially me, driving around the state as a public employee. I'm a state employee. And people would say to me, so, you're a full-time professor down there? And you're, you're driving around having coffee with people like us? How is that hard work, right? How is that hard work? Or sometimes they'd ask me, so, and this, not a many times, but like two or three times, people would say to me, when do you take a shower? And I'd say, this is getting uncomfortable, right? And mind you, I mean, many of these groups are <laughs> predominantly men, if not all men, and so, it's a little bit of an odd dynamic at times anyway, but they're asking me, when do I take a shower? And I say, well, in the morning before I go to work. And they'd say, exactly, exactly. See, I work so hard that the first thing I do when I get home is take a shower, right? And so in their mind, like sitting behind a desk, looking at a computer all day or teaching a couple classes a week, how is that hard compared to the work that I do, two or three jobs, breaking my body, so that by the time I get to retirement, and I don't have a pension, Kathy, by the time I get to retirement, I'm not going to be able to do much. I'm going to be worn out. And so in all those different ways, they're saying to me, you city people, you're not working hard. I'm working hard, and my taxpayer dollars are going to pay for your health care and your pension in your relatively high salary. Yeah. <laughs> so that's partly setting the stage, right? OK. Another is this sense of people in many of these communities have had long ties to where they live, if not that precise place, somewhere nearby. And what they remember was a more vibrant community. You can drive through these communities and see the main streets and see the way they're boarded up and know that there was a better time in the past. Right? It was a more vibrant time, more prosperous time. And people remember that and they have a sense something has happened. Some one or some group has taken away that good quality of life. And they're looking for explanations. They're looking, if you might say, for targets of blame. And there's also a sense in which, I mean, it's very much about status. I think I learned over time is a better way to talk about what's going on than social class even, because people have a sense that we were in better standing. For example, we white working class folks, that's my label, they wouldn't use those terms. It used to be the case that doing the job that we do in this particular place 
meant a good life. How can it be that I can live right here doing the job that my dad did or my grandfather did, they would be saying to me, and not have the same life? Something has happened to my status. It's been threatened. It's being threatened, and it's been taken away. And it also, these sentiments have been very fertile ground for a, a desire for a massive change in government because people are both telling me, look around at my town, whatever government is doing is clearly not working or not working for people like me, right? And they see government as an urban thing. So even if there are public employees in their town, which there are, I mean, across all of Wisconsin, roughly 10% of the, the population works for some level of government, either local, county, state, national. And those, even if those people live right there in their community, people perceive that the way they do their jobs or the decisions that regulate their jobs, those decisions are made in the cities by people steeped in urban values and urban experience. And so they see government as an urban entity. And they don't think uh, government's listening. So my state was a bellwether. And I say that because what happened in my state has happened in various other states, and you could argue in the country as a whole and perhaps in other countries around the globe, right? So what happened was there's these sentiments, right? And then this person, Scott Walker, runs for governor as a Republican and wins in 2010. And within a month after taking office in early 2011, he proposes this legislation called Act 10, which was part of a budget reconciliation or budget repair bill, I should say. And what it did was to outlaw collective bargaining for basically all public employee unions. And in Madison, this was the reaction. Thousands of people protesting week after week, sleeping overnight in the Capitol, so occupying the Capitol. But 20 miles, if that, outside of Madison, the reaction was not, this is the worst piece of legislation ever known to humankind. The reaction was, it's about time. It is about time. Because these public employees sitting behind their desks all day, they have health care, they have pensions, and we're paying for them to have all that stuff. And they have these salaries that are higher than ours. In a lot of the smaller communities, that's empirically true. People were saying, it is about time. And Scott Walker was subject to a recall election. He was the first governor ever in the United States to survive a recall election. And then he's won re-election, and now he's running again in 2018. And then we had Donald Trump come on the scene. And I'll briefly, I won't dwell on him too much, but I'll briefly explain how I perceive that he tapped into similar types of resent, or sentiments and resentment. And mind you, so it's not the rural population that is responsible for the, the Donald Trump win. I mean, he did very well in rural areas, and I'll show you some maps in a moment. But um, it, was a, it was an important part of the electoral co coalition that brought him into office. And so I should just say briefly that we often, you hear a lot these days about how the white working class was um, important or responsible for the Donald Trump vote. And I can say more about that later, but keep in mind that the, the majority of people who voted for Trump were quite um, well off in terms of income. And so we'll probably have discussions across the course of the day about what do we mean by the working class, right? Um, but. The rural resentment mattered for Donald Trump in that it was in, he, he could not have won without it. So a little bit more on how I think that he tapped into the sentiment. So this idea that people want a change in government, I mean, Donald Trump spoke to that in a variety of ways, right? And I'll just share with you some of his slogans. So this slogan of draining the swamp, right? Like wanting to come into Washington, D.C. and completely just deliver something totally different in terms of federal government. Draining the swamp was his shorthand for wanting to do that. And also, it's, it's meaningful that his opponent was Hillary Clinton, who many people in my field work in 2007 despised her. There's a lot of 
gender involved in those comments, sexism, um, but also people saw Hillary Clinton as someone who was steeped in the Washington, D.C. establishment. This idea that she had been in D.C. government for 30 years definitely was part of the way people were talking and thinking about her. And with her as her opponent, the chance at his rallies of lock her up tapped right into that sentiment of, we don't want more of this. Like We want to jail it, put it away, lock it away. Also, the Trump campaign brought to light just how um, divisive, racist, nativist um, the, this resentment can be. And uh, need, I'm sorry to rehash this, um, but birtherism, right? We have to remember that Donald Trump is the person who popularized this idea that Barack Obama was not eligible to be president of the United States because he wasn't one of us, right? He was not, he was a foreigner. The idea that he was not even an American citizen caught fire because of Donald Trump, right? He tapped into a sense of where is this country going? Where is the United States going? Um, it's something has happened and it's been taken away by others, those others, right? And this idea that you could argue that the sitting president of the United States was not actually even one of us, the fact that that idea was so powerful is one example of the ability um, or the power of this idea of resentment to, to be fertile ground for arguments that there's an us and there's a them and them, they are to blame. Birtherism was one part of that. Building a wall was another, right? The stride in anti-immigrant sentiments in his campaign. Um, and then since taking office, the Muslim travel ban and also the ban against transgendered folks uh, serving in the military. In all of these ways, Trump is, is tapping into this sense that something has happened. We're looking for targets of blame and it seems to us that uh, it's those others who are at fault. Making America great again, finally. This idea that there was a better time in the past, and if only we could return to it, we would all be better off, right? It's kind of, you think about those folks sitting in a diner on a main street in which you can look out the window and see the boarded up shops. It resonates with that pretty strongly. Before I go on, I want to share what this sounded like in the views of the people that I spent time with. So you've heard me, but now I want to share with you some of the conversations briefly. I'm going to give you a few examples. And this is before Trump is around. This is before Scott Walker is around even. But these are examples of what the, the rural resentment sounded like. Um, the, the first example I'll give you is from a group of women who meet once a week um, in, a, in a diner. Well, they, now they meet in the basement of a church, but initially they were meeting in the back room of a restaurant. And they're in the far northwest corner, very small town. It's a tourist town. And I'm asking these folks what they think about the university. And so um, I've asked them, what do you think the university does well? And now I'm asking them, what do you think the university does not do so well? And Teresa, actually, I'm going to use my hands to represent different speakers. So this is me, and these are different speakers, just so I can give you a better sense of the conversation. As a former educator, I resented highly comments such as, there's no education north of Highway 8. Highway 8's a, a highway that runs east-west about the top, across about the top third of the state. We send them such, such absolutely excellent and well-prepared students there. The attitude that we are the hick area or the country bumpkin area of the state, it was painful. So who did you get that from? From recruiters to the university? No, from professors. Really? When they would visit here? Yeah, or publish in newspaper articles or other, you know, and that was a little dis distressful because I think northern Wisconsin feels a little far away from Madison anyway. And we keep waving our hands and saying, yoo-hoo, there's another half of a state up here. Up north is not Wausau. Wausau is a, state in the middle of the, a city in the middle of the state. 
Here's another example, a group of people meeting once a week in a church basement, it's men, women, some stay-at-home moms, some farmers, some business owners, um, and they, everybody knows in the community gather every uh, Tuesday morning at 1030. This is, these are all women responding again. I'm asking them again, what do you think the university does not do so well? Represents our area. I mean, we're like, we're strange to Madison. They want us to do everything from Madison's laws and the way they do things, but we totally live differently than the city people live. So they need to think more rural instead of all this city area. We can't afford to educate our children like they can in the cities. Simple as that. We don't have the advantages. All the things they do, Madison and Milwaukee, never us, based on Madison and Milwaukee. Yeah, we don't have the advantages that they give their local people there, I think, a lot of times. And it's probably because they don't understand how rural people live and what we deal with in our problems. Okay, now I'm going to read to you a more comical one because this has been depressing enough, right? Okay, so this group of people, this is all men, and they meet in central Wisconsin in a small town in one of the lowest income counties in the state. And I had a hard time finding a group in this town. No one seemed to know of a group of people that gets together regularly until someone confessed to me, well, there is the dice game, this group of people that get together to gamble every morning. <laughs> and they, it's a group of men who meets in the back of a restaurant. And if you're told that they're there, you know you go into the restaurant and you walk to the back of the room and you go through a curtain. And lo and behold, there's a group of guys gambling every morning. And they start at 6.30, and they end at 7.30, and at 7.25, there's a dollar round. So that's part of the background. Another part of the background is that there's a horse auction going on in town on this day. And they're asking me about the horse auction. Um, it's either all men and me. Why don't you buy one of them horses? I got a trailer for you. And they're talking to me. Well, I'm not sure where I would keep them. They know I live in Madison, and there's, there's not room for a horse, much less a trailer. And, 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 um, and this guy says, huh? I said, well, I'm not sure where I would keep him. Oh, you keep him in Madison. That's where they keep all the bullshit. <laughs> yeah. Well, basically, all you got to do is buy the front end of the horse. They got the back end in Madison. <laughs> right. So very funny. But the problem is I'm playing dice with these folks because the first time I spent time with them, they stopped playing dice, and at the end of the game, they said, so do you know how to play ship captain and crew, which is the dice game that they play, and I say, yeah, I do. I mean, I grew up in Wisconsin. Yeah, I know how to play that game. Okay, well, bring your money, because if you want to come back, you have to gamble with us, right? So I'm gambling with them. Yes, all kinds of ethical questions, I know. Yes, um, I can't wait. I come and I ask for your thoughts, and I take your money. Oh, I tell you what, that's good, though, because we have so little of it, and it all goes to Madison anyway, right? Ha, ha, ha. Yeah, so I'm joking along with them because I'm super uncomfortable, right? Uh, well, we expect nothing less from Madison. Oh, at least it won't cost any postage to get it down there now. <laughs> all right, so now that you're laughing, I'm going to turn to Europe. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so this is a, a, a map of the 2016 returns, presidential returns to the United States. And if you're familiar with the United States, you know that the, the coasts are where most of the urban areas are. And in this map, the blue counties are those that went for Hillary Clinton, and the red counties are those that went for Donald Trump. And the, the shading shows just the intensity of the vote. And basically, as you probably all know, rural America went for Donald Trump. Coastal urban America, largely for Hillary Clinton. Here's another map, though, that, that is to make the point that this isn't new. The ur urban versus rural divide in terms of the party leanings is not new. And this map shows you change um, increases in Republican votes since 1996. And you also might say, yes, but there's been a rural versus urban divide in the United States since Reconstruction, for sure, or before that. Or there's been a rural versus urban divide in human society since we had things called cities. And we can talk about that more later. But my short answer is that there's something different about what's going on now. And that we're not just talking a correlation here, but a kind of a correspondence between cultural perspectives and political leanings that coincides with this ur urban versus rural split. This is just to show the darker red areas are where the Republican Party has made the most gains since uh, 1996.
turning to Germany, right, just briefly to show some recent results, which you all are familiar with, but, you know, great, stronger support for right-wing so-called populist parties in the more rural parts of Germany, right? Um, but here's also just a, it's more another map showing the shift, right, during, in recent time periods. So it's not just that we see a correlation, but the, the correspondence has been growing. In the French election, too, probably these are all familiar to you, I imagine, um, that in the, the, we see a correspondence again with the right-wing populist <clears throat> candidates in more rural areas. Um, Brexit, too. Right. So I want to end with three thoughts and then look forward to your comments. One is there's this recurring question of what's the relationship between globalization and populism? So we see this in Wisconsin, the United States, Germany, France, uh, the UK, um, other places around the world as well, right? What is it that's driving this relationship between globalization and populism? And oftentimes the way this question gets put is, is it economic anxiety or is it cultural anxiety? And my answer to this is, well, it's both. What I hear in the conversations that I've witnessed is people saying to me both um, an expression of um, concern about their economic welfare and expressions of uh, perceptions that the reason that they are not very well off is due to other population groups. And so there are these claims about we're not doing so well um, in worrying about their own economic standing, their, both their status and their, their economic security, but also placing blame on specific population groups, including racial and ethnic minorities, but also including public employees, urban elites. But I say that they're intertwined uh, based on some other just fabulous work that's being done around the world with respect to globalization and populism. I'll just give you a few examples that um, I'm really struck by Kirk Banzak's work out of the Immigration Policy Lab in Zurich, where he talks about, the, he's, he and his lab have shown that um, people, there's an aversion to immigrants, right? But people seem to be more willing to allow in immigrants who are going to, they perceive are going to benefit their economy. And I think that's an interesting way in which the, the, both the cultural anxiety and economic anxiety are intertwined, right? Or Sasha Becker's work out of the University of Warwick, um, where he's looking at the UK and he's looking at uh, migration patterns and looking at how, um, yes, so there's anti-immigrant sentiment, but it's also, um, you know, an aversion to the way in which uh, places that have received the, um, the um, largest migrant populations have been um, related to slower growth in wages. And so, you know, what's the driver here? Is it the change in, the, in wages or is it the change in immigration? Um, I want to say that um, right in the audience today, Brian, Professor Brian Burgoon's work, I've learned a great deal from and really enjoyed learning about too, which gives us this very important lesson that we have to keep in mind that it's not just um, economic, as objective economic circumstances that are an important driver, but people's perceptions of relative standing. So his work, if you're not familiar with it, you should go to the panel, I think he's talking about it today, um, is it shows that, you know, it, it's the relative gains or losses when you look across different income categories in the population that seem to matter. And people's kind of standing over time with respect to other population uh, deciles or categories. And then it's not just static measures of income or unemployment that are the drivers, but these relative gains or losses, losses I think, is a really important insight. Another thing I want to touch on is um, our, I'm a public opinion scholar, and I spend a lot of time talking, thinking and 
and talking about um, populist sentiments within public opinion, but I'm increasingly wondering if that's where I should be placing my focus. Meaning, so Larry Bartels, um, I should back up to say, what I'm going to argue briefly here in just um, a few more minutes is that typically, I started off by saying I didn't want my question to be how, what are people getting wrong, but instead, how are people understanding the world? But I find myself increasingly involved in conversations that are about what is wrong with these people? Why are they voting the way they are? How could they vote for Donald Trump, right? And I wonder if that's the right question. Should we be asking what is wrong with these people? Or should we be asking instead, what is wrong with the political elites who have used these sentiments in a way um, who have argued, when I talk about the politics of resentment, what I'm talking about is a style of politics in which people are selling policy or selling themselves on the basis of saying there is us and there is them and it's them that is to blame and vote for me and I will make that right. As opposed to selling us policies or themselves on the basis of here are the policies that I am going to stand up for, and here's how they are going to make us all better. That's the kind of politics I dream of, but it's not happening. Um, I one, So to make this argument that I, I'm wondering about this question, should I be asking what is wrong with these people, should we be asking what is wrong with these people, is that these views are in place before the Great Recession, right? So I'm starting my field work before 2007. And that's um, helpful, I think, because the, pol the politics have happened after these views were in place. Also, my colleague Larry Bartels at the University of Vanderbilt, who had been at the University of Princeton, has recently, this is, I should say, just a blog post, but I think it's really important. What he did was to analyze European social survey data, and his argument is that, look, Populism might not be on the rise. What might be on the rise is a different form of politics, perhaps. And what this graph is showing you, this is Larry's graph. He's showing us these six different measures of populist attitudes, and he's basically arguing, you know what? They've been sort of constant since 2002, 2015. And I would love to hear your reactions to this across the course of the day. Um, but here's another graph. He also charted out kind of the level of support for populist candidates across these countries and is arguing here in this graph that it's just a small segment of the population. Again, I'd love to hear your reaction. But it's part of my, my wondering, you know, is it more elites, the parties, the, the choices that they're making that should be where we're focusing our attention? Finally, just one brief word. Um, about the importance of focusing on the perspectives through which people are viewing the world and the political world. Oftentimes we talk about people's political preferences, meaning their, their policy choices, their candidate choices. But to understand those choices, I think it's really necessary to think about the lens through which they're viewing the world. That's a bit harder to capture through public opinion polls. But I think what we're finding in the United States context is that it's that stuff. It's, it's the way people are interpreting the candidates and the way they're interpreting their world that helps understand why people voted for Donald Trump, why they make the vote choices that they did. So thank you all so much for your attention. And I really uh, look forward to your comments and questions. So thank you. Thank you.